Smart meters are electricity meters that don't have to be read by a person. Instead, they wirelessly send your home's electricity use to your utility in real time. Your bill then shows how much electricity you used and when, making it easier to better control your energy use. Old technology meters require a human being to take a meter reading once each billing period. Smart meters can report consumption in real time by wireless transmission. Inside the smart meter are three different electronic circuit boards, the brains of the unit. They're built on large blank fiberglass panels. One panel yields six or eight identical circuit boards depending on the meter model. In the first machine, for tracking purposes, a laser etches a serial number for each future circuit board. The next machine applies a stencil in the pattern of the components to be mounted on the board, then spreads solder in paste form across it. The board now wears solder paste, shaped and positioned exactly to receive the upcoming components. The next machine's two lasers verify that the solder paste application is perfect. Depending on the size of a specific circuit board component, there can be anywhere from 5 to 20,000 of them stored on a tape reel under a transparent protective strip. Workers mount the reel for each component on what's known as a pick and place machine. This computer controlled high speed device peels back the protective strip and picks the required parts off each reel, then places them in their designated solder pasted position on the board. Bulkier components are stored on a different size reel, which workers mount on another type of pick and place machine. It does the same operation as the previous one, only slower due to the larger size components. The boards now travel through a soldering oven. The precision controlled temperature, peaking at 468 degrees Fahrenheit, melts, then cools the solder paste, fusing all the components to the board. Next, each board undergoes testing. This machine applies electricity to ensure each and every component meets specifications. When the board gets the all clear, it moves to the next machine, which cuts it into separate circuit boards. Meanwhile, robots assemble the meter's digital display. They take a plastic half-circle housing and install a liquid crystal display into its rectangular window. At the next station, a robot uses a vision system to align snaps to attach a circuit board to the liquid crystal display. Assembling the meter body begins with the plastic base plate. The first station prints a serial number on the bottom. The next station then flips the base plate upright and installs the components of the remote disconnect switch. This switch enables the electric company to switch power on and off from any location. A switch cover closes up the base. The protruding wire will connect to a circuit board. The next station installs two terminals through the switch cover. These function as part of the switch operation as well as part of the meter's measurement of electricity consumed. Once those terminals are in, an automatic screwdriver secures the switch cover. Now, the first of three circuit boards. This one, the metrology board, measures energy consumption. The unit comes off the automated line and a worker completes the assembly. He attaches a connector to the digital display circuit board, installs the display, then connects the switch wire to the display's board. The metrology board sends its measurements to the display circuit board, which interprets the data and sends it to a third circuit board, which transmits it by radio frequency to the utility. Once workers have fully assembled the housing, they install a metal tamper evidence seal. Every meter undergoes rigorous final testing. An automated station verifies the display using a vision system. It checks that the remote disconnect switch operates properly that the meter measures electricity accurately and successfully transmits and receives messages.
Stilton is a creamy and crumbly British blue cheese whose roots date back to the early 1700s. It tastes mellower and less salty than many other varieties of blue cheese. Always produced in an 18-pound cylinder format, it has veins of blue mold radiating from the center outward. The production of Stilton is strictly regulated. Only half a dozen dairies in the world, located in three specific English counties, are licensed to produce it. And only from locally produced pasteurized milk. It takes 20 gallons of milk to make each 18-pound cylinder of Stilton. They begin by pouring milk in a vat. Next, they add starter culture, laboratory-grown natural organisms. Then they mix a blue mold culture called Penicillium Roquefort with distilled water and add this to the milk as well. After about three hours, they stir in rennet, enzymes that coagulate the milk fat. After about 90 minutes, workers run a wire knife through the now gelatinous milk, separating the fat, called curds, from the liquid called whey. Then, overnight, they drain the whey out of the bottom of the vat. The next morning, the firm curds go through a mill, which breaks them up into a crumbly consistency. Workers weigh out portions of 24 pounds, each of which will become an 18-pound cylinder of cheese. After adding salt, the company won't disclose just how much, two workers gently hand mix the portion. Two different mixing styles blending the ingredients more thoroughly than one. Then they funnel each portion into a cylindrical plastic cheese mold called a hoop. The curds still contain whey, so workers stack the hoops for five days. Typically, cheeses are pressed to drain the whey, not Stilton. Here, gravity does the job. The cheese drains under its own weight. Workers flip the hoop once daily to drain through both the top and bottom. After five days, they remove the hoop. The cheese, now drier, stands on its own. While with a knife, they perform a critical procedure called rubbing up. They rub the entire surface with a flat blade, sealing all the holes so that air can't penetrate and cause premature internal mold growth. Now the cheese goes on to a stillage, a type of trolley, and begins its journey through the climate-controlled bluing rooms, named for the color of the internal mold growth, which occurs there. Workers flip the cheese daily to prevent its cylindrical shape from distorting under its own weight. Within a week to 10 days, grayish-white, sometimes orange, naturally occurring mold begins growing on the outside. And from that point on, when the cheese acquires a certain amount of mold, they move it to the next level room, then to the next one, and so on. At about the five-week mark, they mount the cheese on the turntable of a piercing machine. With each press of a foot pedal, the turntable rotates slightly, and long stainless steel needles pierce the cheese. These tiny holes permit oxygen to enter and kickstart the penicillin Roquefort blue mold culture that the dairy put in the milk earlier on. Before long, blue mold gradually grows from the center of the cheese outward. To monitor the extent of the blue mold growth, the dairy's cheese graters draw samples using a tool called a cheese iron. The iron reaches all the way to the core of the cylinder. When the sample shows that the bluing runs right through, the cheese is ready, more or less. The timing's actually a bit tricky. Stilton is a relatively young cheese, best eaten between 12 and 14 weeks. The dairy does its best to coordinate shipping so that the cheese is at its optimum quality when it reaches the customer. Therefore, it ships eight or nine week old cheese to local stores and seven-week-old cheese to international customers so that the Blue Stilton will be an ideal eight or nine weeks of age when it arrives at its destination.